<laughs> Welcome to another episode of Vet Talk, man. Today I got Mr. Thomas Lukin. If you go on Twitter, you see him as DMZ Korea. Oh yeah, our how are you doing today, Mr. Tom? <laughs> yeah, Korea DMZ vets. You'll see it on Twitter. So, but hey, how you doing, bro? I'm doing good, big bro. Doing good, man. So for the audience, man, just for them to know, man, this is our first time actually officially talking, meeting each other. So, man, this is going to be exciting, man, just to do something off the well, man, with no filters, no editing, no, you know, um, list of things we're going to do. We're just going to talk, man. Oh, I'm cool with it. You know, uh, and I'll, I'll cover my background, give you an idea, but uh, I actually friend of mine uh, uh, has a radio station as a vet himself, uh, Levi Miller. Okay. And uh, right. for about five years, I did a radio show for him called uh, The Veteran Show. It was through WMR uh, Radio, and he's based out of Atlanta. And so, okay. uh, so we used to we used to do that all the time. It was kind of unfiltered, you know. Uh, so, because every veteran's different you bring on the show, you know. It's like people ask, you got set questions. And it's like, no, because every veteran's different, you know, from a time that, you know, uh, there's, a, you know, there's different things you ask based on, you know, the era, the branch they serve and so on. And, yes, sir. You know, and MOS and so on. There's so many different things. So it changes up the question. That's why. And a good close friend of mine who lives not too far from me, Harold Mason, we he co-hosts the show with me. And so. You know, people ask the script. I said, hell no, because yeah, I yeah, just ain't right, you know. Because <laughs> what I would ask uh, somebody in the Navy, what they did or talk about is going to be totally different yeah. than what you and I might. I mean, you and I would be similar. I was a scout. You were an engineer. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, just to get everybody, you know, who's this gray hair bastard, as you said. Um, my name is, as he's as Ben said, is Tom Lugan. Uh I, I'm getting old. I'm going on 60, by the way. But uh, 60 young, 60 young. Yeah, tell my body that, man. <laughs> tell my body. But uh, I just give a kind of a background who I am. Uh, uh, I was born uh, July 1st, 1963 in Peoria, Illinois. I was adopted out of there. I was adopted as a child at birth. Uh, I'm half okay. Indian, half white. My parents uh, are... I was adopted by an old, you know, uh, farming family. So, okay. And, uh, but my parents, but, uh, when I was four, we moved to Missouri. So I, uh, we lived outside what we call Florissant, in Missouri in North County. And that's okay. where I did all my school years at. And, uh, 81, I graduated from high school. I tried going to college. You know, how I said, tried. I tried to go to college. For- <laughs> Sound like me. Yeah. And uh, I went to college for a semester. I said, uh, hell with this. And, uh, and what is it? About two months into college, I uh, uh, signed up for delay entry for the United States Army as a cavalry scout. Wow. 19 Delta. And so 1982, I went in, uh, went to Fort Knox for basic AIT. Uh, it was a rude awakening those days. It was still the early days of what we call OSIC for combat arms, as you know. You know, one stage yeah. you in a training. Because I still remember 40 years later at the uh, reception station, and everybody who's seen the movie Stripes, that was filmed at the reception station they used for scouts and tankers at Fort Knox. Okay. And so I remember standing in front of one of the World War II barracks, I think it was, and our drill sergeants had us facing the wall, you know, facing the wall of the barracks, and they were standing behind us. And drill sergeant yes, pack, as they say, you never forget your drill sergeant. You're quite correct. <laughs> it's been damn near 43 years since I went to basic, and I still remember drill sergeant pack quite well. And I remember drill sergeant pack going, "Yeah, you know, are we okay with cussing on here, bro?" Oh um, well, because I'm trying to keep it, you Clean, know, okay. PG a little bit. That's yes, right. Sir. Well, yes, it's sir. just the way he worded it. But, uh, you know, he turned, uh, he could hear, the, and I'm sure he saw him back in the head. You could hear his next words. You MFers are mine for the next uh, four or 15 weeks. Because all of us were told, well, you go to basic here for eight weeks, AIT here six, seven weeks, whatever it was. 
No, we all got the rude awakening, found out we're having the same drill sergeants for 15 weeks. You know, we were stuck on one place. And that was the early days because I forget, it was like a couple of years before I went in, they started OSIC for combat arms. So, yes, sir. But that, that's a no, story that, I haven't forgotten. It, it just something goes back. To that. No, but she, I mean, being that you was a, because you, because um, you were 11 bang bang, as we call it, 11 Bravo, right? No, I was 19 Delta. I was a scout. 19 Delta. Was a scout. Okay. Okay. So how does that work with scout? Because I always thought most um, people who went in as infantry, they, I guess they secondary or they um, schooling would be um, scout. I, I, that's how I thought it worked. How does that work? Or how did it work? Well, for many years, the way it worked and I've lost track, you know, after well after 2000, but, uh, it used to be, okay, uh, scouts, 19 Deltas themselves, you know, we were, we were divisional cavalry scouts. Uh, you okay. also, in your armor battalions, your mecha mechanized infantry battalions, we uh, did a reconnaissance for them. We did scouts. Now, okay. the light infantry battalions, they always did their own scouts. So, okay. so uh, what you would see is the light infantry battalions, yeah, they did their own scouts. But with the mech infantry, they would bring in, you know, 19 deltas. Yeah. You know? And so okay. they, your old armor battalions and so on. I know it's changed. You know, they've gone with the, uh, you know, the army's ever evolving and changing things. They yes, sir. Years, as we know. And I've seen them, I've seen them for, you know, for 20 years. And so, uh, but just so you know, I say 20 years, I was in for nine and a half years as a scout. Um, uh, 1991, after Desert Storm, I ended up getting out, and I worked as a contractor in Korea for over nine okay. years. Okay. And so, okay, uh, okay. I just where were you at in Korea? If you don't mind me actually interrupting you, actually. Oh my God, I've been all over Korea, but uh, because I was stationed at Cape Red Cloud, man. Just for all the people out there, oh, I was at Cape Red Cloud. <laughs> that baby's closed now, man. That's that's closed. I know they were closing a lot of things when I left. Um, because I was. My first duty station was Korea. I went there. I joined 06. So I would say 07, 08 is when I was in Korea. Oh, see, now my life, my last time in 2000. Now, as a contractor, I was based out of Camp Casey, but I covered. Okay, yeah, I know Casey because I used to always go up there. Um, and I was in the veil, man. I was going to say. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, okay, trust me, I. You know, but no, I too much yeah. drinky, drinky, juicy, juicy. <laughs> oh yeah, tell me about some you. Um, but no, and uh, I worked as a contractor out there. No, yes, the, uh, CRC Camp Red Cloud closed. Is that eighteen or nineteen? They finally closed it down. Oh wow! They finally wow. closed it down, and because two ID, two Second Infantry Division headquarters. For those who know what two ideas is uh moved down to camp uh humphreys now and they're based out of humphreys so. see when i was there they were talking about um everything moving to humphreys at some point well you know i remember that what's funny my first time in korea was 1983 right okay and they were talking about closing young sign and moving it then and that was 40 years ago bro yeah <laughs> So like, I wish I could have got my dad on here because um, my dad actually was stationed at the DMZ as a Marine before he ended up um, leaving the Marines. And, you know, the Marines don't accept prior service. So he um, ended up being Army Guard. So, um, yeah, that's that's actually where he was stationed at back in, if I'm not mistaken, in the early 80s sometimes. So I think you and him have almost a, a similar what, timeline. What, what the Marines would do when they would come over in the 80s, you know, besides a couple of, like you had uh, – you had some uh, some of the training exercises went on, but there was one point. Uh, there's a marine one. I just want brain dead. I know it, but I know the marines used to train with the Moroccan marines up in the north, away from us, because like yeah. when we were up in the DMZ patrolling, that was over there uh, by Pamujan, over in the western corridor, as we called it. But the Marines okay. would be up in the northeastern section, way past Piantech, uh, if you know where Piantech is. And that used to be uh, Camp Page was okay. was at Piantech, but uh, way east of there. But the Marines, I've known uh, guys from Marines that were over there back in the 80s, and they used to train with the Rock Marines up there in the DMZ over there. So oh, yeah. What they, they, oh, yeah. My dad told me a lot about that. Yeah, I know, I know they did that. So, 
But no, uh, my first time in Korea, though, was uh, I was there as a contractor, 91 to 00. And I got okay. out in 91. It's funny because people ask, well, why did you get out, you know, with that amount of time in? And I said, well, I wanted to make a career of it. But I was my going through a nasty second divorce. I was a single parent. Yeah. And those days, the military did not like, especially the Army, did not like single parent combat armed soldiers. And, oh, yeah. and with, a, with Desert Storm over, it was over the Cold War. Desert Storm prolonged the Cold War, basically, the drawdown. But once Desert okay. Storm was over, you know, a lot, I know a lot of guys, a lot of us were E5s, E6s around 10 years in, and we knew what the drawdown was the name of the game. You know, promotions oh, yeah. were going to nil. And so I know a lot of guys that got it, but a lot of my big reason was a nasty divorce. And I, you know, and yeah. and my and two, I know I. Uh, how do you want to say my record was not probably the greatest because I had a mouth on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but being a single parent combat arms because you know I I was passionate about the military. You know, I was not an awards yes, person sir. or any of that. Uh, you know, and I was slow on rank. I proved that in Boy Scouts too, but I was always slow on rank. You know, and uh, <laughs> something to do with the mouth again. I think <laughs> so. <laughs> But, no, uh, but you know what? For my experience, um, gentlemen and such as self or ladies, um, y'all made the best NCOs. The ones who actually struggled to get through the ranks, y'all were sometimes the most wisest. And I would say the best NCOs because y'all understood what it was like to be at the top and the bottom. So it's like you were more relatable when it came to um, soldiering. Because I, I know when I first got to Korea, I remember I got my first Article 15 because um one of my battle buddies we ended up we was at, so we actually was in Casey and we were supposed to be um getting back to um Kent Red Cloud yeah. before curfew but we already knew we was going to ditch so we was like okay we going to ditch we're not going to go back on post we just going to stay out in the ville you know after the MPs go um go away and um, what ended up happening is one of my battle buddies was so drunk, he started acting stupid. Oh, and instead of me leaving him, you know, the number one rule, you can't leave your battle buddy. No matter what's going on, you, take care you of your have boy. to stay there, with your battle, or stay there with your battle buddy. So that was the only reason why, instead of me getting Article 15 <laughs> to where I, I got my own rank took, and they gave us 14 days extra duty, and we just had to, you know, dress up in full battle rattle, buffing, waxing floors for 14 days. And I mean, they made it a cakewalk for us. And the reason why they made it a cakewalk for me, because they were like, dude, you know what, man? You handled that like a, you know what I'm saying? Like a true soldier because you ain't leave your battle buddies. You took care of them. And to say all y'all were drunk, you act like you was the most sober person in the world. Like they couldn't even tell I was drunk. And they kept asking me, they like, hey, you drunk? And I'm like, man, I'm gone. They like, but brother, it's nowhere in the world you drunk. <laughs> And you have more, you know, you more sensible than I was like, bro, we already in trouble. So the last <laughs> thing I want to do is make it harder on myself. So let me just take care of them and get out this situation, man. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Oh, I can tell you, you know, uh, back in the days in the 80s, Casey, uh, Don Dutron, TDC, now they call it D. And they don't spell it with a T. It's with the D. It's Don, yeah, it's Don Dutron. Korea, and, and, and I'm fairly uh, a bilingual fairly, you know, I spent a lot of time in Korea and, you know, with the Korean family. So I, I can speak a fair amount of Korean, but some of the words are, uh, are, uh, you know, like, uh, Koreans have a hard time with, or T and D are very close. And that's why sometimes over the years I've seen spellings change. Like they say, Dong Du Chan now. And in Korean, there's no real Dong or Tong. It's Hong Du Chan. It's kind of like a TD mix, you know. It's like okay. it's like the Koreans, uh, you know, uh, can't use the letter F except in one word usually. <laughs> and uh, but they can't use. They have a hard time with letter F. That's why coffee, for example, is a good example. They say coffee. They pronounce F's as P's. Okay. But now you will okay. not hear Koreans say puck you. <laughs> and i did that with a friend of mine years ago a good friend of mine brian his wife mija i look at mija i said if koreans have and she's korean actually and i go to mija i said if koreans have a hard time with the letter f how come they uh don't say puck you and she laughs she looks at me she goes no you're right she goes that's pretty sad you know and that was my uh I should say she was a friend of mine, too, because I, I still talk to Brian all these years later. We still stay in contact. 
But yeah, yeah. But you know no, what? Just, you explain so that's my I would say that must be why every time I needed to go get some boom boom, instead of saying the F or we just said boom boom, because I didn't she understood boom boom. When I said boom, you, oh, you want boom boom? Yeah, let's go take me to go find some boom boom. <laughs> <laughs> some things still vary, but it's it's funny. Uh, but yeah, yeah. But no, there are just certain letters they have a hard time. You know, like Germans always okay. have a hard time with uh, which letter yeah. is it? Oh, W's. W. Yeah, yeah you know. Because it was V's botting instead of Wee's botting. Oh, yeah, or <laughs> Wiener is Wiener. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like Wiener Schnitzel, we would say, the Germans say Wiener Schnitzel because they can't say W. So, and, uh, but yeah, Koreans were the same way, especially with the letter F. They had a hard time. My wife still does, but they have a hard time with the letter F. So, and, and that's when my wife's Korean, so. Yeah. Also, you, you, you're Luna. <laughs> Two of them. My second wife was Korean, too. So, well, give me my background in Korea. I was there 83, 84 with 47 Cav up in uh, the okay. Western Corridor, up at Camp Gary on in Yonjago. I say that because okay. uh, 47 Cav, I've seen them move three times. Uh, yeah. But, uh, then I was there 83, 84, 84. I went to Fort Rowley, hated every minute of the three years there. Uh, 87, I went back to Korea and I spent three years in that tour and I was all over the place with the cab. Uh, I got there, it was Bravo Troop 80, uh, Bravo Troop 47 cab in 87. 88, we re flagged uh, 517 cab and there's a whole story behind that just recently. Uh, and, uh, then in 88, I was with the Air Cab, last days of what we call the Blues Platoons. And uh, so I was with the Air Cab down there. That's where we had air inserted scouts in the Army still, left over from Vietnam. And okay. 88, uh, we disbanded. We were the last place in uh, the Army to have uh, Blues Platoons. Well, we uh, terminated the Blues Platoons and... Uh, and I won't get into depth on the reorganization, but I got stuck with the new air cab being the training NCO, but my first start. So we moved okay. up to Camp Mobile there across from Casey, and I spent a year there uh, with the air cab as training NCO. And, so uh, where exactly was that? Was that close to Castle? Because I remember on um, Camp Mobile, the Camp airfield. KC, they kept Castle. Okay. If you come out the gate okay. at Casey, the gate one, Straight, you go straight across the road as you're heading. Uh, Castle was up on MSR one, heading north, like the Soyasan or Rodriguez Springs. I I know okay, Castle. Yeah. Well. If you go out, you know yeah. where Nimble was, Camp Nimble. No, sir. See, you, you, I'm gonna be honest with you. A lot of the names I'm hearing from you, first time, um, it, it, it's different because like only ones I remember was Casey Stanley, Castle. Um, and Humphreys, because I remember we went out, to, we did a training exercise out in Golf 510, which was probably like 20 minutes outside of Humphreys. Oh, we okay. went to a rock. We we went, um, we actually had exercise out there at a rock compound because when I was over there as a diesel mechanic, I was in a support battalion. Um, the workhorse, which I supported this, um, the General Ramirez, um, out of G Tech, Geronimo Tech. Which was the actual motor pool that I worked for, um, uh, that I worked in when I was over there. But most of my time I spent driving, so I didn't really do mechanic work. I was driving the whole time. They had to suck <laughs> driving to Casey all the way down to Humphreys. I done that. Oh, God. <laughs> Trust me, I've driven a lot in Korea. I, I did. And it's gotten worse because the amount of vehicles on the road is, uh, uh, grew quickly compared to the roads growing, yeah. the amount of uh, tra uh, roads yeah. and traffic. But, uh, yeah. no, I was at uh, Camp Mobile was right across the street from Camp Casey. It was, you had H220, which is the airfield there, then Camp Mobile is part of it. Oh, you talking about where we got our equipment from? Because I remember they yeah, had a I base forgot. that we would go to across the street from um, Casey. We would actually get, that's what we, um, CIF, uh, we would turn in our stuff. Yeah, yeah, I forgot. I got they you. moved CIF. Actually, they had the turtle. In the 90s, they moved the turtle farm now. When you got there, they probably quit saying turtle farm. But uh, but the uh, replacement detachment moved to uh, uh, mobile in the 90s along with CIF. Oh, wow. And CIF was there for quite a while, yeah. I forgot they did move over there because I had a friend that yeah. worked at CIF as a civilian. 
Because when uh, he kept saying, I'm like, I, I think I know who he's talking about, but I, I know it as CIF. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was Cam Mobile. And oh, wow. towards the back, or some, uh, they were brand new barracks in 88. So there are, okay. and, and, you know, even now, here we are 34 years later, they ain't that old of barracks. You know, yeah. we're the Army. What does the barracks become old? Oh, maybe after 60 years, <laughs> 70 <laughs> years. Yeah. And, and, and even then, I tell you, what, I was back in 2015, I went back for a visit and a military visit. I got to go back. And because I've done a lot with 2ID and the association and, you know, with the DMZ stuff and so on. So I got invited to go back for an all paid expense trip. Okay. And I went back in 15, and I, I was surprised to still see so many old tin built temporary buildings that were built in the 50s and 60s or <laughs> insulated now. It's like, y'all still haven't got rid of these yet? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like the Green Mile, man, which was on um, Kent Red Cloud, man, one of the famous um, hills, man. They call it the Green Mile. I think that's, I know where you're talking those, at. That's one of those things that I know anytime somebody was a PT failure, our, our first sergeant wanted to just smoke us that morning for um, PT. And we go around the Green Mile, which was a mile in the woods, but it was actually stairwells. And I mean, oh, oh man, it was cold blooded. I think it, was that over by the bunker? It, uh, you know what? The bunker was over there because I remember anytime we go drop off ammo, it leads to the bunkers, but it was right behind the golf course okay. where the generals and all that stuff lived at. Yeah, because the bunker. All right, second, for your information, uh, Second ID headquarters moved to Camp Red Cloud in 94. They were at Casey. Then they moved to oh, Red wow. Cloud. You had Combined Field Army there, which was core level. And they were at Humphreys, and, and they closed down in 94. Second ID moved down there. In fact, General John Abrams, the son of Creighton Abrams, and, uh, and the brother Robert Abrams, who just recently retired, but General John Abrams was the division commander at the time. and But they oh, moved wow. division headquarters over there. Well, the bunker uh, is where G3 was for the longest time. Because I know in the 90s, uh, I was working with what we called the UCOFs, Unit Conduct Fire Trainer. Though, what those are, or were now, were the Bradley and Abrams simulators. And okay. I worked primarily with the Bradley ones. I did. I was a senior instructor, but I also did maintenance. Well, the division master gunner asked me to uh, attend some of the conferences for the Bradley side, and because I'm, okay. I'm an old Bradley guy anyway from Scouts. So uh, I remember the first time I went to the bunkers. Like he goes, "You never seen this before?" I said, "No, it's our second ID tell a few years ago." <laughs> but. Uh, you know, so I remember, that's why I remember the bunker, because I went to a few meetings before I left out of there, so, and, uh. Okay. But, yeah. I, so, I, did y'all used to do field problems on the backside of, um, Kent Casey? Because I know there was, like, an actual field, um, the exercise they would have where, um, people would come from different, I would say, um, duty stations in the U.S. They would come over there once a year. And I remember they would have the they would have in, infantry out there with the Bradleys. I remember we supported it, and we had to go out there. I remember it was so cold that we couldn't drill the stakes in the in the ground because it was so cold. But I forgot what that one big exercise was called. But I know it happened once a year in Korea. Uh, full Eagle. It, it, that 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 may be the name. It's been so long for me. I don't remember. I know it was a one field exercise to where they came during. I would say I think roughly around like December is somewhere around there. It, there's a couple of different ones. It might have been Full Eagle. Full Eagle uh, started in 1989. I know it ran to 2017, and because uh, <clears throat> it was still going while I left, and I've done some research a while back on it. If, in fact, I took. I uh, downloaded photos off uh, the National Archive site and made a video call. You know, uh, it's called uh, I'm putting it on YouTube about Full Eagle. But uh, okay. Full Eagle uh, ran from like '89, I think, to 2017, 16, somewhere in there. And uh, okay. it might have been Full Eagle. Uh, you weren't talking to Hobie Cut, were you? You know where the Hobie Cut was? That was the area between Camp Casey and Camp Hobie. You know what? You know what? We were we we were out there too. Cause I remember we had to drag our trash tent 
from Kent Red Cloud out there, we set up and had this little mock um simulating area, but that was one exercise that we did do, but we did two. I remember we did two because that one was a little bit different because we stayed in we stayed in the barracks on the backside of Humphreys between um Hovey and I mean not Humphreys Casey and Hovey we stayed up in there somewhere in some barracks but then there was another field exercise I remember we did and I think it was a little bit more closer to the DMZ but only thing I can remember about that place was it was the coldest what? time of my life because it was freezing cold well, you had Twin Bridges training area was used that was more towards the western corridor. Now, Rodriguez Range, sometimes also known as MPRC, multi-purpose. You know what? That sound more from that sound more familiar. <laughs> yeah, Rodriguez Range. Trust me, I know that one well. I know that from '83 to 2000. Even when I was a contractor, we had simulators. I had to go out there and support. So I spent a lot of time at Rod Range. Because we still had pop belly stoves when I was out there, man. Because I remember every night <laughs> we were on rotation of guard duty, filling up them pot belly or filling up the tanks for the uh, pot belly stove because that was the only source of heat we had out there. And I, when I say that stuff don't work out there in that cold, oh my God. Oh, trust me, tell me. Yeah, that five gallon drums are going to keep those five gallon <laughs> drums going on the old pot bellies. You know what's funny? Those pot belly stoves, I don't know about World War II, but I got pictures from the Korean War. They were using the same damn pot belly stoves that we, you know, here you are 50 years later at the time, you know, when you were there, 50 plus years later, it's still using the same, you know, pot. Now, let me take a step back. Speaking of Korean War, I don't know, they were still using them when I left, uh, I left Korea in 2000, so I kind of walked away from the Army. And you got to remember, I told people, in 91, when I get out, I went back overseas to work as a contractor. I said, all I did was change uniforms. I went from uniform to wearing civic clothes. I said, for nine years, my life was dedicated to working with the soldiers, working with equipment, you know, and I worked around the military. I said, you know, the only thing I could do is I get away a little more who I could cuss out than I could. But even though it's a civilian, <laughs> you still get to watch some P's and Q's once in a while. Yeah. You know, yes, and, sir. uh, but, you know, I was still around the military. I was still around my, you know, the GI. So I didn't, you know, I didn't have to do PT at 0600. So <laughs> especially in January, it's like, yeah, I mean, oh, run by Lord. my apartment. It's like, yeah, I don't miss that shit. <laughs> That's why I was so happy. I was on flag detail at Kent Red Cloud. That, that that eliminated me from doing PT. I did flag detail. So that helped me out a whole lot. Oh, yeah, I don't miss cold mornings in Korea. I had I had four of those of two tours to start with. And uh, doing PT in monsoon during monsoon season. Oh God. You know monsoon <laughs> season in Korea. I remember eighty sevens was real bad to rain. And it was there was no sense of wearing your wet weather jackets. <laughs> the you, whole ugly ponchos. Or the ponchos, but we had the wet weather gear and jackets and if you wore you it was senseless to wear because you sweat to death yeah. underneath it. You're going to be yeah. wet, whether it was from the rain or sweat, because it was so hot and rainy. <laughs> so we did, I, I was one like many, just didn't wear it. I said, I really let it rain and wash my uniform out because all that rain, what weather jackets could do is make you sweat like a devil. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened to me when we went to the 203 range because, you know, out there on um, where you were talking about, they had a 203 range. That's where we used to go uh, qualify for our 203. Yeah. And I remember, um, we like we had to don our gas masks and shoot the two or three at the same time in order to qualify. I was like, man, this is just horrible. I'm like, Korea was the only duty station I had. I went to that we had to qualify on every weapon known to man. Yeah, well, you know, you know, let's take a step back in Korea. We said this for years. We always said there's the army, then there's the army in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> Things are a little different. Oh, yeah. pretty, everything's different. Okay. Now, anywhere else in Germany, in the States, whatever, you got TASC, Training Support uh, Activity Center, right? Yes, sir. Korea? No, it's TSAC, Training Support Activities Korea. But everywhere else is <laughs> TASC, or Training Activity Support Center. But Korea, it's TSAC. Korea, it's always got to be something a little different than the rest of the Army. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's why a lot of people AIP to stay there for for majority of their career, man. Because I met people 
who were there forever. Like, um, I don't remember. I don't know if you remember, um, at Camp Casey, they had a flower shop and they had these two black and Korean little girls that work and they were uh, with their mom and the PX in the flower shop. Well, I was dating one of them, <laughs> but her dad, he actually, she, he was actually there for 30 years and never went back home. Last name was Amuse, was it? <laughs> that sounds familiar. Oh my God. I'm serious. Because it, it was still, God bless it was two, it was, it was two black and Korean females that worked in there with they with their mom in the flower shop, right before you go where you get the stage rights and all that other stuff. Um, right, like because I know you walk through the food court and that first little shop right there as you walk through the food court, that's where they actually worked at. Yeah, see, the flower shop was in that not because now you were <clears throat> excuse me because you were there. Around, oh, you said 06 to 08? It was 07 08. 07 08, because I left in 2000. Now, I forget how old his daughters be. Friend of mine, Ron, and Ron was older than me. Ron was, he was, <laughs> Ron was 60 when his two daughters were born back in the mid 90s. So I doubt it was them. Would it, it could have been, but it could have been Muse or, uh, Maybe Tate. I can't. I can't remember. Well, I'll be honest. With you, I, I can't remember. Because <laughs> I think I know by then, my buddy of mine, Bobby Tate, his daughters would have been that age. Bobby was a. Bobby had the Black Rose Club he owned for years downtown. Okay. And a black guy, and uh, yeah. but good people. Bobby was a big, but yeah. a gentle giant. Bobby was muscular, thick, and the nicest guy you can meet. And. Yes, you know, and uh, and but he uh, he owned the Black Rose Club for quite a while. Him and his wife. His wife was Korean, and they had two girls and a son. And because his son Rajin and my son John were good friends, they were the same age all through the nineties. Okay. So Jeffrey, okay. or not Jeffrey, Johnny and uh, Rajin were hanging together. Bobby knew my son, and so okay. uh, Bobby was always good with my son. But me and Bobby were friends too, you know. But the funny part overseas, uh, you know, when you got very few American civilians, you become a tight group overseas and nobody sees color. Oh, yeah. You know, unfortunately, oh, yeah. uh, in the States, I we still, some people still seem to have a damn problem with that. And I won't start browbeating on some of the crap. <laughs> I can, you know, and, and a good friend of mine I mentioned earlier here in Mesa, I did a radio show, an old Army friend of mine. He lives up in the south suburbs of Chicago. And okay. me and Harold, Harold's three, uh, three years younger than me. And we talk about it. And, you know, it's like we talk about, you know, how we watch the civilian world. And it's like, you know, when it gets to me about the civilian world, it's like in the Army, granted, the Army wasn't perfect, but we didn't have the issues as you do in the civilian yeah. world. What racial issues. Yeah. And it, yeah. it really bugs the hell out of me and Harold because we talk about it. I'm mean, Harold's black, by the way. Yes, and, sir. Uh, and, and a brother, my true brother of mine, you know, close friend, yes, long sir. time. And I broke him in how to drink soju, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Was a gold label? Was a gold label a kettle? No, no, a gold label. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Now, let me take a step back. Another friend, a good friend of mine, lives up, he lives on the south side of Chicago. <laughs> Dor uh, Dorian Welch is his name. Me and we didn't know each other. We found out years later. You know, one of the good things of Facebook, you make friends, you know, social media. There's a lot of yes, cons of social media, but I've made some good friends, veteran friends over time. Yes, sir. And Dorian, uh, a little younger than me, but Dorian was in Korea when I was a contractor in my old unit twice. And so, and we get together when me, Harold, and Dorian get together, and uh, we always get together. And usually, Dorian brings soju, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> we we both kind of broke Harold in doing the soju thing. So, but when we get together, it's kind of a special, you know, it's a brother thing, you know. You know, yes, we get sir. together as brothers, and we got to have it, and it's just tradition, especially me and Dorian. You know, he was in Korea. His first time was ninety two, ninety three. His second time was ninety five, ninety six. And okay. so, uh, you know, and it's funny because when we first met, he told me, uh, uh, we got talking about whose uh, money was there. I said, damn, Dorian, we probably seen each other and not even knew it because I, you know, I, <laughs> well, I cover that area a lot with dealing with the simulators. And yes, so, uh, 
but uh but no it's just back not to get on it but i know me and harold we've always you know it, it's like and you're talking guys that serve in the 80s and 90s you know what we didn't have any issues. Oh, we tell some horrible racial jokes amongst ourselves. <laughs> you know. And hey, well, that's what family do, though, man. I, I mean, a family hindsight each other. I, I, don't, I don't get where people think you have to be politically correct when you talk to the family. It's different when it's family. Well, and that's what the military <laughs> is. It's family. It's family, man. And all oh, guys, you know, I, I don't, you know, and we're bad amongst my own family. I'm half Indian. You know, my sons are all, you know, my wife's Korean. My youngest son, who looks like his mother, has his mother's face, he actually gets his height from his mom's side. He's six one. <laughs> My dad's five eight. I'm short like a typical Indian and Korean. <laughs> but uh, he tells the worst Korean jokes on humor. He's the worst one in the family, you know, and he's Korean. And uh, But no, it's just, uh, it's funny if people would hurt us in the military. And, and I know my... My, you know, my sons, they still do it to close buddies here, you know, uh, and so, but oh yeah, if they, so if the outside world heard how we were at times, they'd be highly upset. <laughs> you know what, but, but, it's just, but you know what, they can be, and that's why, um, I did one of my videos, um, on this book right here that I, um, read called No Apology Necessary, it's, it gives a biblical perspective of how, Basically, enslavement happened. And when I found out what actually happened and who was responsible for white folks enslaving black folks, which in Isaiah 19, it was God doing because of idolatry. I mean, my heart was already changed before that. But now it's just like I even understand more to where I don't even see racism as I once saw it or how people would tell me the story. Now I just see it as Hey, it's a biblical event that happened because of disobedience. And anybody such as yourself who know about God, God has a way of punishing people when they don't do what he tell them to do. So I don't look at it from a perspective, oh, the white man. No, I look at it as God did this. And you know what? Let me stay on his side <laughs> so that I don't end up on the other side of his wrath and put myself in a situation. So I, I don't I don't see it like that. And I thank God for the opportunity to even do this video with you or how I did with Mr. Chris Arm. Um, Connerton, because it just, I believe that I've, I've been put on this earth to continue help break the racial barriers that exist. Because I, I know it's invisible, but it's just time for people to come out that whole mindset and get away from that to where, man, listen, if me and my white brother sitting here having a conversation, he happened to say some black jokes, I can't get offended by that because I'm going to say some white jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, it's like, you know, my youngest son, a lot of his friends I know well, and me and my youngest, of all my sons, we're probably the, I'm the closest with. And he's the one most like me. The others are like my, you know, my wife, like their stepmother, because uh, my youngest is from my current wife. And like I said, my second wife okay. was Korean, too, and I had two sons with her. And But my wife raised all my sons, you know, even uh, her, their two stepsons she raised as her own. You can tell because they act like her, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, but no, my youngest is the most like me, you know, he's got his, he's got his few attributes for mom. I mean, uh, and they're Korean attributes. <laughs> they're very Korean attributes at times. I mean, you, I never seen a person who, could, my son is very cordial, very well mannered. Uh, yeah. he's 27 years old. He'll be 28 on Thanksgiving day. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and it's funny because he was born in Korea, nineteen ninety four, Thanksgiving. Oh wow! And or he like he likes to joke around and tell everybody, yeah, nineteen ninety four, I effed up Dad's Thanksgiving. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, and, uh, and and that's how we are. We talk, you know, we're rude and crude and humor, and and my whole family's <laughs> like that. Even my siblings yes, are, and my parents. And, uh, and of course, you know, Jeffrey, he used to bring it on himself, but he gets, you know, my, 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 you know, uh, like I said, I'm adopted, but my parents are white. Uh, my sister's adopted, but she's the one that fits in with the family. She's blonde hair, blue okay. eyed, fair skin, you know, like typical German and Dutch. You know, my brother was the natural born. <laughs> and Tom has always been, you know, I'm, I'm half Indian, so I get a little darker skin, brown eyes, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, or you know, he probably get upset at my mother now because as a kid, you know, I still get out in the sun not as much as I did as a kid. But I was constantly out in the sun, and uh, I I get dark as hell. And so, mom, and back in the day, people see you know they see me, and my mom, go, oh, that's my black child. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm always, you know, because I'm always darker. Or, or you get my sister when we're kids, we go to the uh, town swimming pool, right? She yes, be, sir. She'd be putting on, you know, like a, I would just say it like a typical white person. She'd be putting on the so suntan lotion that trying to tan. <laughs> Tom don't have to try anything, and we'll be at the pool three, four hours. She might come home with red on her. You know me, I just come home darker. And for me, this little mom said, I don't get it. How come Tom gets dark and I can't tan? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even trying, you know, it's just natural, you know. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, and, and family, we've always have kind of a mix. So I think that's where I've probably gotten used to it all my life, you know. And, and I got yes, a mix of my fam, my side's even more mixed, you know, Korean wives and, you know, half Korean children that look all Korean. You know, the only, the only, the only white they get out of me is they can grow facial and body hair. And my sons, they look, all look very Korean, and two of them, they grow beards thick, like mine. And it's like, people look at us like, how do you get such of a thick beard? And they know he's Korean. It's like, he's not full Korean. <laughs> so, I don't and, know. Uh, but no, no, I... I, it, it's getting people to break the, you know, the racial thing. And it does bother me. And I know like me and my buddy Harold, we've always said, you know, and, and we got to be good friends, you know, and not because of color, but as friends of color, it was always been our point to be, uh, to be more proactive and showing people that you could be friends, you could get along and it don't matter. And, you know, like me and Harold, we got so many similarities uh, we're both bad about saying if our wives were white, they'd be blondes. Did you get me on that one? Oh, oh wow! No, we we were my wife's Korean, his wife's black. We both say if our wives were white, they'd be blondes. <laughs> <laughs> we're both bad at saying that because they both are. They they would be blondes <laughs> if they were white. And his wife is a sweet the way they guy. At. <laughs> yeah, the way they, the way they act. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Having blind moments. <laughs> oh, and mine does. I just look, you know. And of course, some people probably get upset. Well, you know, that's not nice. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> so I know I, I'm married. I'm married to a black woman, and she she has blind moments. So. I get it. <laughs> See, <laughs> I call her bougie. That's that's the word that we say. I say bougie. I like, baby, you just bougie or extra. That's another word we use to say you just over the top. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny? My wife does some dingies, being I'm fluent and more fluent enough in Korean. We'll be somewhere, you know, especially where we live is very few Koreans outside of my family, especially speak the Korean language. And she'll do something dumb or say something dumb. So I'll look at her and I say, yeah, Pobble. Pobble is Korean for stupid. And she'll get mad. Shut up. Which, you know, is Korean for shut up. <laughs> it's like nobody understands oh, wow. what we're saying. But I'll be saying, Pobble, Pobble. <laughs> 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 Screw with her. You know, and no one will make her mad. So, you know, and because uh, she'll do a blonde moment. It's like, oh, my God. You know. And my wife's English is only so good. So, you know, I said that to her one day. I said, you're just like a damn blonde. She just looked at me, what? Boyo? Boyo? <laughs> Korean for what? I said, forget it. My son, my youngest son just died laughing. You know, he, he knew what I meant. <laughs> so, and, you know, but back to, you know, you, you got me started about the race thing. You know, with the family, it's so mixed. And, um. You know, I, 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 and I learned a long time ago growing up, and I've always had friends that are multicolor. And even though where I grew up as a kid, we lived on the edge of town. I went to school, and we had kids in there, uh, you know, of color. I mean, I've had kids who are, uh, you know, grade school. 
I had two black buddies. They were identical twins. They were the only two in the class in my whole class. Okay. But nobody saw yeah. Ken and Keith as being black. Yeah. Sometimes they had a hard time telling which one's Ken and Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Identical. That sounds like Alan Blankenship in my neighborhood because I had all uh, one white guy that grew up in the neighborhood that I'm from, and his name was Alan Blankenship, and he was—I mean—and you couldn't tell he was white because he grew a, a afro like us, and he get it braided. And everything. Hey, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, you know, sometimes even if, uh, you know, like a friend of mine would say, I'm not, I'm quoting him so people don't, oh, why is this guy saying it? But, you know, blacks have been so integrated a lot of time that, you know, it's like my buddy Harold, which is Harold. It's like Harold would go, you know, if you look at a true African, they are damn near black. He goes, you look at a lot of uh, black Americans, they're more lighter tone in skin compared to uh, African yeah. Actual African, you know, Africa, African and Africans from Africa. That's why it's always, yeah. you know, but uh, I know Harold, we talked about it because like Harold, you know, Harold sits there, you know, he's, he's got some uh, English mix in his blood and his through his family. Now you look at him, you wouldn't see it or we would tease him. He goes, you know, I'm part of English. We just laugh at him. <laughs> 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 Yeah, and, and it's, here you got me and uh, another friend of ours, the black, just giving a shit. We just look at him and laugh, you know, yeah, right, you know, and we know it, but we're just giving him a shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just like, but that's amongst brothers, you know, again, like you say, uh, amongst family. And, uh, you know, but people need to settle down. People need to, uh, and, you know, to do it. Uh, one of the things that bugged me, and it still does, not that my 20, he's 27 now, but not that my boy can take care of himself, Jeffrey. And, uh, cause he's a, he's a big kid, 6'1, 250, uh, uh, all muscle. He looks more small at times. He's thinned out a little bit. <laughs> because, you know, he's so thick. And actually, let me take a step back. I got a story on that one. Uh, he was working corrections, uh, for a while. And, uh, a couple of years, about three years ago, a uh, guy in there was from Chicago, by the way, you know, this is Illinois. And, uh, he goes, are you, he goes, what are you? And Jeffrey goes, well, I'm Korean. He goes, my God, you're the biggest flipping Korean I ever seen. You know what I mean by flipping drop the up. <laughs> and he told me that. And after that, I started looking, I started calling him the BFK. And of course, now all my friends do it. They know Jeffrey. They call him the BFK, you know, and include my buddy Harold. You know, everybody gets a kick out of it. But, but I told Harold not too long ago, I said, you know, my son, even though he's going on 28, he's been so moved and changing career, you know, doing career moves. And that's another story. But I said, you know, if Jeffrey ever marries a, a, a black chick and has kids, if he has a daughter, I have a granddaughter that way. You know, his wife is black and I have a granddaughter. We can't yes, use that sir. BFK anymore. I, I, I'm not going to have somebody walk around and say my granddaughter's from black fucking crazy. <laughs> no, no, no. The boys are fine, not the girls. <laughs> yeah, because I, who knows, you know, in our family, you never know what's going to, we're going to match with. <laughs> I know. I know, and I think that's one of the blessings about my son is, man, him growing up around me, he he has a choice of what he want to choose one day. Right now, you know, I keep him away from the whole dating thing until he get, you know, until he's old enough to really date and, um, you know, be prepared for marriage because I'm trying to, you know, set him on a different course than the course that I took in life. So, um, I mean, he, he's free to marry whoever he want to marry, man, because at the end of the day, like I tell him, long as she loves you, son, that's all I care about. But I do want you to marry somebody who's different because I love food. And one thing about Korean food, oh, my God. Oh, my <laughs> God. Well, see, that's, oh, my God. See, <sighs> hey, man, that's what's good about having a Korean wife. I get a lot of Korean food. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny, my youngest son, especially because he lives close to us, he comes over. He's a meat, He's carnivorous. But uh, but mom will make a lot of meat for him. I'll get very little of dinner. Next time he's walking home with big tubs of meat. It's like, I'll ask you, can I get some more meat? No. Oops, 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 you know, if you remember what oops, oops means, you know, we don't have any more. 
Then I'll see him leave. He's got a bag with two big tubs. And he goes, oh, yeah, Dad, Mom had some leftover. You know, like, you know, okay. <laughs> I'm being ganged up by two Koreans, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but, no, I, I enjoy my Korean food, you know. And uh, so uh, I got some. Uh, the word I remember was, be- the word I remember um, from the girl she taught me was um, pegopa, pegopa. Mean and I'm hungry. Pego pie, yeah. <laughs> Means you're hungry. You know, pop mogul. Hey, pop mogul, pop mogul. Uh, food, you know, let's eat food. You know, and uh, that's what pop mogul is. You know, marshy soul, it me- it's good, marshy sale. You got to remember it's the difference between talking to your peers and talking to your elders. The words are different, by yes, the way. Yes, sir. But, uh, yes, sir. yeah, pego pie, pego pie. So, and uh, pebble low means you're full. So, ah, pebble all, pebble all, that means you're full. So, see, I've been, I've been around, I've been speaking Korean too long. I could do it without thinking about it. (laughs) I'll tell you what's funny. When I came back from Korea in 2000, there were certain things I knew in Korean, you know, that wasn't in the States in the past. They had by then, because I spent, you know, you're talking from 1987 to year 2000. I was pre- spent most of that in Korea, except for I was at NTC Fort Irwin six, 16 months with two of those months at Iraq for Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Okay. And that's California. You know, a lot of us don't consider California power the United States. Oh, I said that. I'm sorry. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> no, but I was there, and but I was in Korea most of the time. But there are certain things that come back, and it's like, I, I was like, Oh shit! I know what it is in Korean. It's like, well, what the hell is it in English? <laughs> <laughs> then it gets worse. My Korean friends, I get accused of being more Korean than my Korean friends are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because when I was there, oh, when I was there, oh, seven, they were they were learned. They were they were basically infusing English into everything. So majority of them, when I was there in 07, they could, a lot of them could speak English, and that was cool because I remember I'd be riding on the train, and I keep seeing Adashi look at me, and I'm like, why does Adashi keep looking at me? And then he look, he like, yo, hon boy, what's up, man? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm like, you can speak English. He's like, yeah, man, I was in the states, da 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 da. I'm like, what? what? So the whole time I'm looking at this guy, thinking he just speaks Korean. He actually speaks English. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. 2015, I was over to visit. And in fact, the one day we were, I was there for a week. The one day we were in the marketplace, you know, at uh, Weijambu outside of CRC. Yes, sir. And I see Ajma there. Uh, for, for those listening, Ajma means Korean for mom or, yeah. or missus. And uh, you don't say madam, you would say Ajma. That's the same. Yeah. And uh, but I walked up to her and I asked her in Korean. I, it was rice cake, dolk. I asked her how much rice cake was in Korean. And this is in the marketplace. I say this for a reason. And I think it was like two, uh, three, four thousand won. She come back and instead of saying tunwon, which is four thousand won in Korean, she looked at me and goes four thousand won. I'm just like staring at her because years for many years most people were. You know, we're in the marketplace, have no English, no knowledge of it, because they never were yeah. educated. Yeah. And that's when I realized, of course, you know, she was probably late 30s, maybe around early 40s. So I'm thinking, you know, yeah. my mind's going real quick. I said, I bet you she grew up learning English. She's that, she's young yeah. enough. Where, you know, yeah. you take, you know, somebody who's my age, she really didn't get English, you know, unless they're yeah. around the GI areas, you know, the American areas. And but yeah. when she responded to me in English, I was like, "Oh my God!" That's why I realized creative change. <laughs> Believe it or not, it may sound crazy, you know, because I'm thinking I left in 2000, and you would never get a response in the marketplace in English. It always being Korean, <laughs> you know. And that's like my buddies, you know, they want to go to the marketplace. My American buddies, uh, you know, uh, they drag me along so they don't have to drag along the wife. They dragged me along because I spoke, you know, spoke Korean well enough that I could go down and ask how much it is or question some. So uh, I always end up going down to second market there. That's what it is in Korea, second market. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, 
No, I, Korea, I spent a lot of time over there. You know, it, it's always been part of my culture, still is. It's my family. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, and we raised our sons to be proud of being American and Korean. And as I've always yes, told sir. people, be proud of who you are. You know, if you're black, oh, yeah. you're a black American, be proud that you're black and yes, you're sir. American. You know, yes, sir. and, you know, sometimes you hear like, well, we shouldn't use a hyphenated like uh, American Korean or whatever, you know, black American, whatever. It's like, why? Yeah, everybody's Americans, but what's wrong identifying with a cult subculture? Yes, sir. Yeah, because there are cultural differences, even though I used to always tell people, um, we're the same people with different flavors. That's really what it is. That's what it boiled down to. Yeah. That's how I perceived it because... I mean, when I was stationed in Korea, that's how I was. Like, I realized Koreas, Koreans were just like me. They love rice, and I love rice. So we were, like, best friends. But, <laughs> you know, what's funny, my buddy Harold, he, you know what Hot Links is, right? Yes, yeah, sir. All right. And when we first became good friends, we got talking about Hot Links. He looks at me, he goes, you like Hot Links? Yeah, why not? Ooh. You know, and I, and for Ooh. years, I didn't know why. It wasn't until about a couple of years ago we we're talking. He goes, you know, hot links is an ethnic food, you know, black ethnic food. I go, <laughs> no, but you know what? It's funny. I got hooked on it from my black friends many, many years ago. And, you know, because we, we were grill out half drunk naturally and have hot links. And it's, I, of course, I eat hot food, so I love hot links. Yeah. And to remind oh, yeah. you, my buddy's up in Chicago area, and Chicago is pretty much the home of hotline. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, now where are you at? Uh, where right now, I'm actually, I actually live in Fort Worth, Texas, but I'm from South Carolina myself. Oh, okay. I'm actually from South Carolina. I knew you said yes, special sir. time, you know, when we were messaging before. That's not yes, that sir. Serious. Yes, sir. I'm in Fort Worth, Texas. That's where I live at now, currently. Okay. I've been here since, um, well, off and on, I've been in Texas since 2008, because that's when I came, well, I came back. Yeah, I came back to um the States from Korea in 08, and from 08 until now, and it's just been off and on living in Texas. But I'll tell people, um, Texas is my actual permanent home now. I love it. I mean... I love it it's because you get a mix of country and city, and I love that whole feel because that's how Korea was. Like, Korea was sort of like living in the country, but it was city. It was like a mix of both. I mean, I agree. And I mean, man, I I loved it there. I mean, to be honest, you, had it not been for me staying there for a whole year straight, I would have actually stayed there longer. But it was just like, for me, I got burnt out living there for a whole year straight <laughs> without coming home. And that was my first time actually being away from home. So it was just like, I got to go back. And the girl I was talking to, um, her name was Marnetta. She was like, she like, Slim, Slim, you go home. I like, yeah, I got to go home. She, I like, I, she like, so you know, marry I like, I'm a, I want to marry you, but. I can't stay in Korea for my whole life. I like come back to the States with me. And she like, no, I want to stay here. And so I ended up having to leave, man, which, you know, was a hard decision at the time. But, you know, thank God I did come back because I probably would have never met my wife now. And, you know, we wouldn't have never had my son. So, you know, all things worked the way they were supposed to. Uh, it's, you know, it's some say, I mean, I don't take it wrong. I am a God fearing man. But, I, you know, some would say that's God's doing. I'm saying, that's just the way nature works out sometimes, yeah. you know, just how yeah. life goes. And uh, Yes, sir. Especially around my wife, because she's Buddhist, by the way. <laughs> 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 you know, and, uh, and see, back to, I, I'm sorry I jump back to this sometimes, you know, like, mm. I talk, you know, people, you know, I, what really bugs me when people don't understand the differences. My household is so mixed and so, you know, we grew up a Christian, my kids grew up being a Christian Buddhist house. Okay. You know, and we and they grew up in a Christian, Buddhist, Asian, whatever. You know, we got everything in this household, you know. And so, got you. You know, and my kids, I didn't push them hard on church because my wife being Buddhist and we just left it to them to cho choose, you know. Yes, and sir. so I never pushed hard and going to church or the wife wouldn't push them. We just let the kids do decide what they want. Now, John, yes, as he sir. got older, sometimes he would go with his mom to take her to Buddhist meetings just to see what's like. You know, now he settled down with my daughter-in-law, and they, I got one grandchild from that. She's uh, going; she'll be seven in March, 
and or as my okay. wife called my daughter-in-law you talk about white oh my god she's <laughs> white as a ceiling in my office and uh she's real pale <laughs> and, it, and it's funny you know again you know uh People don't, may look at me and say, well, you know, you and I couldn't relate to the color of skin. Yeah, we can, because I'm all of skin just no. like you. You just got to look. Yes, you know, sir. Well, if you look at my arm, it might be different, but it's hard to see. But, <laughs> you know, we're both all of skin, so how we darken compared to uh, somebody as fair skin is different. And, yes, sir. Uh, you know, it's like I look at people, I said, me and my wife use cocoa cream, coke, coke. I can't say it to you, but you know, and people look, well, he did a black person's cream. No, oh, that works good for anybody who's out of skin because everybody's out of skin <laughs> that dry skin. It's a dry skin. Oh, yeah. And trust oh, me, yeah. we both do, you know, and it's funny. We go to the Walmart or something. My wife will be in the makeup section. She'll be looking for a black girl to talk to or Asian girl that works there and not a white girl. And a white girl can't help you. She goes, no. And she, like I've seen her do before, she'll see a black girl and she'll walk up to the black girl and ask her something. She told I want to one day tell the white girl, you won't understand. So she walks away. <laughs> oh my God. And, and my wife's right. It's just in her way. But yeah. it's funny, but you know, yes, the, the girl, I had to explain to the white girl why. I said, you got to remember, you know, we're, we're, you know, both of us are olive skin. And my wife realizes that. You know, a black girl is the same as us. You're olive skin. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And we have the same similar skin issues. The only difference, you're a little darker. Now, I got some black friends I'm darker than. In some cases. <laughs> oh, that's like my siblings. If you see, I have a couple of siblings. They're, they're way lighter than me. Like, their side of the family were more lighter than on um, my side of the family. So <laughs> when people see us, we don't even look like we're siblings, but we actually are. <laughs> just just happen to be like that. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. Hey, I need to cut this off. I'm sorry. And, and, uh, right now, I just realized what time it is. I got another VFW. Oh, yes, sir. I got another VFW oh, yes, chore to do. It's what happens when okay, we okay. pick up track. But we got to go pick up okay. a bunch of chairs somebody's donating to the VFW. And no, okay, I would well, love Mr. To talk Tom, to you again. Okay, well, I mean, we can set up another time to talk, but I just thank you for um stopping through Vet Talk and having a conversation with me about career, which has been a blessing because you got to bring back some of my old memories that were long gone in the back of my <laughs> mind, buried and suppressed down there somewhere. Now you got me thinking about some Yaki Mandu, so... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I understand that. Well, if you ever get up this way, you you need to stop it and visit. You'd be more than welcome. So, and yes, my wife, sir. my wife is old school Korean cook. Otherwise, she knows how to cook. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, tell Aji why I say hello, hello. Oh, I will. Or I call her right. Hamidi. You know what Hamidi is, right? No, sir. Teach me. Hamidi is Korean for grandma. Okay, Hamidi. She's gotcha. Hamidi because she's that old. She's older than me, so. <laughs> she's still a young lady <laughs> oh but you know you know the old saying about korean female or asian females right no sir they look young and all of a sudden one day they do a 180 <laughs> you know they they can look young till they're 70 then 71 all of a sudden one day they just do you know no she, she's 62 and you see her you think she was about 40 Yes, sir. I believe it. I believe it. Cause I know Aji might take good care of herself, man. Oh, yeah. Then you got me. I'm going on 60, and people think I'm a, you a Vietnam vet. How old do you think I am? <laughs> a lot of it's because I got that big old white goatee there, so they just, you a Vietnam vet? It's like, uh, I was 12 years old when Vietnam ended. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Tom Lucan, man. You have a blessed one, and man, we'll get we'll get together on, on another time, sir. Okay, I truly appreciate and enjoy this. And you know, I I've always I've always said this, and I still do, and I preach this: is that you know, you, you get veterans together, no matter what era or even what branch they serve, you always got something to talk about because we all got something yes, to relate to. You know, yes, and sir. if you look at the difference between you and me, you know, which is probably 20 years, but yet we can relate to a lot of things because we both serve. Yes, sir. And anybody yes, you serve and, you know, who has served. And, you know, and we're a small percentage. You know, you, yes, what is sir. it, 7%? Yes, that sir. High? 
Seven percent. I, 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 I always say one. We the one percenters. Yeah, well, I, 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 you want to hear me argue, man? So, but yeah, let me jump off. Yeah, I gotta go get my shoes on and get going and meet these guys in five minutes. So, okay, you have a blessed one, sir. You too, Thank and you I'll much. talk to you later. I, hey, I enjoyed it, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right.